Whoa, that is way too close. Welcome to episode 11 of the Turbo 8th Gen build series. If you guys have made it this far in the build series, you're either A, building a Turbo Civic and you're watching these videos because you're trying to learn something, or B, you're just an OG to the channel and you're a true supporter and I love you. Is that weird? Should I be saying I love you on no, nah, it's not weird. I love you guys. So on this build, we are so ridiculously close to a first start in only 11 episodes. That's not bad. Really, all we're doing is just bolting a turbo kit on, but it's an eBay turbo kit, so there's a lot of stuff that we've had to modify to make this work. As you guys can tell, though, by looking at this engine bay, we are close. In the last video, we finally got the battery mounting situation figured out. We got the check valve finalized, the fuel lines finalized, and all that stuff went down in the past two episodes. But I messed up. And that is probably where we are going to start today's video. If you guys watched episode 9, you would have seen me talking about the check valve and how to install the check valve in the direction of flow. I actually messed up and I told you guys the wrong direction of flow. So if you go back and look at that video, that whole portion of the video is cut out now so that you guys don't get confused. I put in the comments of that video a full description of where I messed up, how the check valve actually works. But since I explained that in a message, we are going to break it down in this video. So the first thing we are going to take care of today is getting that check valve flipped back around to go the proper way so we don't blow up our brake booster and so that we have good brakes when we're hauling titties in this thing. And the way we have this check valve mounted is down under the ECU. So we gotta get the battery pulled out and then we can cut our zip ties that we got on the lines and get the check valve pulled out, flip it around, get it reinstalled, get the battery reinstalled. And then we need to run wastegate lines, the blow valve vacuum line, our boost controller. We need to deal with this whole situation right here which you guys are probably as confused as I am on, but I did some research, we figured it out. So I'm gonna break that down soon. First, let's get all the stuff pulled out and let's get that whole check valve situation knocked out because not gonna lie, I'm pretty embarrassed about that one. I try to give you guys informative videos, but I mess up too and I make mistakes sometimes. I'm only human. Check valves out. Now I can explain this to you guys the proper way because I explained it wrong in the last video, even though you guys can't see it because I deleted it. So inside of this little tube here is a thing called a check valve. Now the reason vehicles have check valves in their brake systems for their brake boosters is because your brake booster gets pulled under vacuum to give you vacuum assist with your brakes to assist the amount of force on your brake pedal when you're pressing it. If you did not have a booster, whether it's hydraulic or vacuum, you would be hammered hammering on the brakes to stop. So that vacuum booster applies so much more pressure than your foot does. And the reason you have a check valve is so that you can maintain enough air in that booster that it doesn't all just leak out right away. You can give it more than one brake tap and you're not gonna lose all that vacuum assist because your check valve is gonna allow to pull that booster under vacuum. So a check valve allows airflow in one direction and not the other. As you can see, if I blow into this tube right now, if I blow this way, Nothing happens whatsoever. No air flows. But if I blow this way, flip the hose around, blow the other way, you can hear the air flowing through. So that just shows that it's allowing air to pass one way and not the other. I'm sure you guys get the point by now, but I messed this up in the last video, and here is where I messed up. Your check valve needs to allow flow towards the engine and not towards the vacuum booster. When you do a pull, especially in turbo application vehicles, and you are slamming boost into that intake manifold, you are gonna be pushing boost into your vacuum booster and you're gonna wreck it. A vacuum booster is called a vacuum booster for a reason. It operates under vacuum. So what does an engine do at idle? It's basically a big vacuum. It is sucking air in like crazy. In order to get internal combustion in the cylinders, you need air. So it's sucking air in like crazy. It's going under vacuum. A brake system check valve goes directly to the intake manifold, which is sucking air in all the time and is under vacuum. So you need that intake manifold to be able to suck air into it in this line, which means that the check valve, if I suck on this hose, this end right here where my mouth is, my face is the engine and my mouth is the engine. It needs to be able to suck air and pull the brake booster under vacuum. This end is the brake booster. I am the engine at idle sucking in air. That is the way it should be. If I'm the engine and we flip the hose the other way and I'm trying to suck in air, it's gonna suffocate. 
I can't suck anything in. So that brake booster is not gonna work. It's never gonna go under vacuum. All that's gonna happen is when the engine goes under boost, it's gonna push air into the booster, which can blow out seals, and it's just not good. So, I mounted it the wrong way, and I caught my own mistake, and I will admit to it. At least we didn't run the car like that, but now you guys know how this works. Now that we got that sorted, I am going to get this reinstalled. So, this end here, which is at the 90 degree bend, is gonna be going towards the brake booster because the engine is gonna be sucking the air this way. So my check valve is allowing air to flow this way and not allowing it to go back towards the booster. So we're gonna hook it up to our barb fitting down here which we already have pre-installed because I built this line once already now just for insurance purposes so I don't get any vacuum leaks or anything I am going to be zip tying these on the barb fittings so that they don't leak which I also did in the previous video but I had to cut them to get it off so now I got to redo my work I don't know if you guys do this, but I go through so many zip ties on like routing a hose a certain way, and then I decide that that's not the way I want to do it anymore, so then I cut it, and it's just a waste of a zip tie. It always ends up getting done in the end, but like, there's a lot of wasted zip ties in this world. I'm probably gonna end up rerouting this again. For now, I want a little bit of a final install on everything so that we know how she all fits. Which so far, I think that this build is coming out so clean even though the parts are ugly. That just takes powder coating. It's the routing of the hoses and the overall quality of the build has been really good so far. Like look at this, look at how crusty that is. Solid. Now that we got that done, the next thing that we need to take care of is the wastegate lines. Because I want to get the turbo 100% mounted and I am not bolting down this turbo until I have the wastegate lines connected to the wastegate because there's no way I'm getting down there unless the turbo is out of the car. Because you just can't reach, it's impossible. So let's get this turbo pulled back out. We're gonna get both wastegate lines connected, run into the engine bay. I already got one run with the E-tape on it. It's gonna be excessively long, but that's okay because we'll cut it to length to wherever we're gonna mount our boost controller which honestly I have been debating mounting right here on the back side of the battery. And the way we're gonna do that is this battery has a plastic battery cover. So I was thinking of mounting the plastic battery cover this way and then we can mount our wastegate on the back side of this. That way from the front of the engine bay, you won't even see it, but then you come down here and you will see all the lines and we can tuck them out this way or however we wanna run them. So I think it'll look clean. Let's mess around with some things and see what we can do. ended up doing a lot more than I wanted to do there. And that took a long time. So we got two wastegate lines run now. They come right out underneath the turbo. We're gonna route them nice and clean. Hopefully mount that there. We haven't got to that yet, but it did mark them bottom and top of the wastegate with a little white paint pen, so I know. Then I got the turbo just mocked up here again. I was gonna do the final install, put the downpipe in and stuff, but then I realized I still need to build my oil line. So the oil drain line, we got our 10 AN line on there with a 90 degree fitting, and that oil line comes right out the back. Honestly, this is so tough on this car with this engine bay because the transmission is directly under the turbo. Usually, you want your oil drain line to be straight down to the oil pan because it's just gravity fed. And the oil just drains out of the turbo back to the oil pan. But in this situation, the only flat spot on the eight gens oil pan is on the front of the oil pan. And this CX Racing Kit actually comes with a fitting like this. And what this fitting does is take this nut off here. It comes with two little crush washer type of things. And then you're supposed to drill a hole in the pan that is exactly the size of this crush fitting. The crush fitting goes through the pan. You put another crush washer on the back side of it on the inside of the pan and then tighten the nut up and the crush washers are what seal it to your oil pan. Rather than drilling a hole and welding an AN bung on there, this is like a super cheap, easy option that you do not need a welder for. But in our situation, I don't have a welder and I don't want to drill a hole in the pan because to drill a hole in the pan, you have to pull this whole 
front end off, I think. Pull the rat off, pull my intercooler back off, which isn't really a big deal because I have no coolant in the car right now. Like honestly, right now would probably be the best time to do it. Then you'd have to drain the oil out of the car, drill a hole in the pan, put this piece in there and you'd have to put it on the front. But honestly, either way, if I do it from the front of the car down to the pan over there or across the back of the engine to the timing cover, tensioner cover, it's still going like a straight line either way. This way is a little bit of a longer travel, but I'll show you guys what I mean under the car if I can. But first I'll hop in the passenger side fender well and just show you guys where this chain tensioner cover is. It is that black plate right above the crank pulley there. Try and focus on it real quick, but it's that black plate up there. And it sits kind of right above the passenger side axle. You can see where my AN line is coming out right here. It sits right there, right above the crank pulley. And we got a fitting sent to us by Jack Spania Racing, which basically replaces that plate and it's got a 10 AN fitting on it so that I can just connect the AN line to this. Oil will drain back through this port into the timing cover right back down to the oil pan. Now, the only part that is sketchy about this is that that is a very long line. It's right near the axle that's gonna be spinning. We are really gonna have to secure that and do a really good job securing it because we don't wanna have a freaking AN line getting wrapped around an axle, ripping right off and then pissing oil all over the place. So the best way to secure a line like that and make sure you don't cut through it is with P-clips like this. And I have some ideas of where on the back of the engine we are gonna mount these. This is gonna be so hard to show, but this is underneath the car. You can see where our AN line is coming out right there, right under the wastegate, goes across past the manifold. It does have a downward slope most of the way, so I think we're gonna be okay. And I think when we bolt the axle cover down, we could put a P-clip on that mount to secure this oil line right there so that it does not come back and hit this axle. And then that fitting can run straight to our little tensioner adapter piece, which is gonna be hard for you guys to see, but it is right there. It's just blurry and super tight down here, but it's right there. So since we have this line run, I am gonna work on securing it first so I know exactly how the line is gonna run. And then I can mark with a white paint pen where we're gonna cut the line. And then we are gonna install that chain tensioner cover piece that Jack Spania sent us. And then we can decide if we need a 90 degree 10 AN fitting to fit to that chain tensioner cover or a straight fitting or what we're gonna do. Then while we're on the topic of Jack Spania racing, I ordered another little package in from them the other day. And this is freaking awesome. We got a full chassis mount short shifter kit in here, which we are gonna be installing in a later video once we get the car running. But another piece that I got that is gonna help immensely with this build in this video is not this piece. I don't know what this is. Oh, that's titanium shift knob, which is weighted. So we're gonna be able to bang gears, but that ain't it. This is the piece we were looking for. And this is what is gonna make us not have to run the stupid freaking CX Racing oil filter sandwich plate because I hate these things. Every single time I've ever run one, they always freaking leak. So I don't like them. Even though it probably would be okay and I'm just being oversensitive about it, this piece is gonna be way better and I'll show you what it is. But before I show you what it is, if you guys wanna pick up any of these parts off of Jack Spania Racing's website, you can use the code Daniel10. It'll save you 10% because who doesn't like saving money? Why would you pay full price for parts if you don't have to? So what is super, super unique about this piece that Jack Spania makes, these 8th Gen Civics are very, very unique in the sense that the factory oil pressure switch is 1 8 BSPT thread or BPT, which stands for British Standard Pipe Thread or British Pipe Thread, which is very unique. Not a lot of companies run that. So it's really tough to find fittings that work with the factory oil pressure switch on the 8th Gen Civics. I tried looking around at so many local like hydraulic fittings shops. I looked all over the place, couldn't find anything. Then I go on Jack Spania's website and they have one that is 1 8 BSPT on this end. Then the other two fittings are 1 8 BSPT on the end so that you can thread your factory oil pressure switch into the end of this. And then this fitting right here is 1 8 NPT. So this fitting here, you can thread in the CX Racing Turbo Oil Feed Line. And while we're talking about that, I'm gonna prove it. How freaking awesome is this? Just tighten it right up, it's perfect. Goes on there, you just gotta tighten it into the block until that's facing up. Hook your oil feed line up to this. Now you got a nice, clean oil feed line. Can still run the factory oil pressure switch. And you don't have to run those stinky old sandwich plates. I hate those things. So the next step in this build is gonna be very, very hard to film because that oil pressure switch and the freaking chain tensor cover are so buried underneath there. I don't know how I'm gonna set the camera up to film it. So I'm gonna just give you guys a wide angle of the car and you'll see me struggling underneath trying to get these parts swapped out. Let's get it. That is so crooked. 
That's better. Don't forget, when you guys are building and fittings, blow out all the crap that's in the line after you cut it. Then I like to burn the ends a little bit to make it a little bit easier to put it in the fitting. One more time. Perfect. We got an oil drain line, boys, and an oil feed. Now let's go get this turbo 100% installed. And then I'll show you guys what we did underneath. It's super clean, and I'm actually really happy with how it came out. It's not what I thought I was gonna do, but I think it might be better, depending how hot this stuff's gonna get. But we're gonna find that out once we rip on this thing. Oh my God, we did it. The turbo is 100% installed. Our wastegate lines are run. The oil drain lines run. The oil feed lines run. We are seriously at a point where we could probably start this thing right now. That took a long time, if I'm being honest. Getting that chain tensioner cover on that has the 10 AN fitting is an absolute nightmare. Jack Spania includes a bunch of Allen key bolts that go with it, and they suck to put in, but they're the only thing you can run because there is indents in the little billet cover. So you have to use Allen key bolts. It is currently 5.59 in the morning. I think we started working on this car at 8 p.m. and I work in 30 minutes. I haven't stopped. I wanna get this car done. I've been trying to grind to get videos up for you guys and get this thing freaking running because we have put this build off for like a year because we've been so busy with other stuff that I have so many other things going on right now too with my house and also just bought another beater daily that we're gonna be doing a little build series on. So there's a lot going on right now so I wanted to crank this one out. So I'm gonna pop a picture up on the screen of what I did in behind the engine for the oil drain line and the oil feed. It ended up being super, super Super clean. I got P-clips mounting everything. There is mounting holes on the back of the engine to run all this stuff. One is an M12 bolt and one is the M8 bolt that usually holds the heat shield around the oil filter housing. You can't run that heat shield if you want to run that adapter block that Jack Spania sent out. A couple things I do want to mention about this kit though that I don't like is the oil feed line seems pretty cheap. So hopefully we don't have any issues with it, but I think that we are going to have issues with it. Another thing is on the Jack Spania Racing cover that bolts to the timing cover. The O-ring on that doesn't really stick out that much, so I'm a little bit scared that might leak. One thing to note that you guys are gonna have to do is the stock cover is not sealed by a actual O-ring or gasket. It is siliconed on. So you're gonna have to go in there, razor blade off all of the silicone off the side of the block, and then I just cut a piece of Scotch-Brite pad so that I can get in there with like one finger and clean up the whole block surface or timing cover surface. Another thing I am kind of sketched out about is the way that I routed that oil drain line. It is kind of close to the axle, as you guys can see right there. It's kind of close to the axle, and if that band ever pops up and slices the oil drain line, we are definitely gonna have some leaks. So I might have to figure out something there, but for now, we made so much progress in this video. I know I wasn't able to be as in-depth as I was with previous videos, but this was just all under the car, and I don't know how I can possibly show you guys with the camera. The camera's too bulky. I can't get in there and show you every specific detail. That's why I took photos so I could pop them on the screen for you guys. Another thing that I did was put the factory uh, cover for the passenger side axle, bolted right up, doesn't get in the way of anything. And honestly, all of the videos on this build series have been so freaking long. And I don't know how long this one is already, but we're gonna try and keep it short for you guys. I wanna mention one more thing, and that's gonna be the vacuum line for the blow valve and our boost gauge once we get it installed. I was gonna run them to this port, but now now I'm realizing I'm gonna have to run so many adapters off this port in order to actually make them fit because right here is my vacuum line for the blowout valve. It is freaking tiny. Another thing I wanna mention quick is this piece that goes on the intake manifold right here. This thing is called like an idle air assist valve or something like that. I am a licensed mechanic and I've actually never seen one of these before, but it usually has a spring inside of it and this plastic piece goes on and it tees in to allow air to flow to each side of the manifold. It's kind of like an idle air control valve, but 
it's like a backup one because this car is a drive-by wire vehicle. So it has an electronic throttle body. So there's no point in having an idle air control valve because the ECU can just duty cycle the throttle plate open if it needs more air and idle. So this thing in my eyes is pretty pointless. I looked online, lots of people sell delete kits for these. So I just picked up a bunch of fittings from my local auto parts store. I don't know if I'm gonna block it off or if I'm gonna put a fitting like this kind of stacked up so that we can run vacuum for our blow off valve and stuff like that because that does go to the intake manifold so that would work as a vacuum port but i'm not sure yet i know i said the last thing i'm going to talk about like three times already but the actual last thing i'm going to talk about is the boost controller setup so i got a honda four port electronic boost controller i got my top vacuum line from my wastegate run and the bottom line from the wastegate run to the boost controller on the side with two lines going to it and then the side with one line coming out it just goes straight to a positive pressure source which in this case we're using the turbo you could use a port on the intake manifold too if you want to but the cx racing kit has a port on the turbo already another thing i want to mention is i did put thread sealant on a lot of the stuff like the fitting on the turbo all the fittings on the boost controller and all of these lines here are all quarter inch and em fuel emissions vacuum line and then the other port there is just a bronze little filter that the honda four port came with as for the wiring on the boost controller if you guys are all nervous and not sure what to do with it it's only a two wire connector it's just a solenoid so what we're going to do is we are going to use this purge valve connector right here and we are going to connect the boost controller to the purge valve because all you need to do is pin your boost controller to a input to the factory ecu which in this case the purge valve connector is a factory input to the factory ecu and that way our tuner can actually control the boost controller using the purge valve output if that makes sense and then they just delete the codes and they delete the purge valve control out of the ecu but i am not a big guy on just hardwiring stuff and i don't have any connectors on me right now so next video i got a kit of a bunch of two pin connectors coming in we're actually going to cut and repin a male and a female connector so that this thing is serviceable i could actually unplug the boost controller because we do have it mounted on the battery plastic bracket and that plastic bracket i just drilled two holes in it and ran zip ties and mounted the boost controller with zip ties i would say it's ghetto but it's honestly not it's super Super secure and it's super clean and hidden so i'm happy with it there's probably other stuff i forgot to mention but if i forgot to mention it i'll bring it up in the next video it is now 6 13 a.m and i work at seven o'clock so we pulled an all-nighter on this thing now tonight technically because it's the next day even though i never slept we gotta edit the previous video so i can get it up for you guys this weekend so that's gonna be it for this video peace out you guys thank you so much for watching make sure to like and subscribe to the channel really really helps me out because we hit our first 5k goal for 2023 i was super super happy with that and now we're shooting for 10k in 2024 see you guys in the next episode